Hello there. Thank you for tuning in to the latest edition of Telil 24-7. I'm your host, Adam Cook, and this week it's a real team effort from my colleagues at Telil Community Television. Later on, Station Manager Becky Borno sits down with Cape Breton Cancel Member of Parliament Mike Kellaway at the Telil studio. And you'll meet the newest addition to the Telil News team. She's Gabrielle Sampson, and she'll be taking on two hours a week of original French language news content coming soon. You'll get to meet Gabrielle later on in the show. But we begin with Richmond County municipal politics, and specifically a study that's been recently undertaken about how many municipal councillors Richmond Council should have, and what the boundaries for those council districts should be. We're going to hear from Richmond Warden Amanda Mumberkett in just a couple of minutes, but first of all, here's a breakdown on survey results that have been compiled by Stantec in terms of Richmond County's current municipal structure, what could be done to improve it, and how your municipal council is doing so far. Stantec began its survey about Richmond County residents' preferred boundary and governance models on July 29th. The first findings were presented at an open house conducted by the municipality in St. Peter's on August the 9th. 73 responses were collected since that time, of which 74% were from people between the ages of 35 and 65. 60% of the respondents were female. Of these preliminary survey results, the highest number came from District 3, 25.7%, or 18 completed surveys. Second highest came from District 1, 22.9%, or 16 completed surveys. District 4 chimed in with 21.4%, or 15 completed surveys. Meantime, District 5 chipped in with 15.7% of the completed surveys, or 11 completed surveys. And the lowest number of completed surveys came from District 2. There were 9 surveys completed for a percentage total of 12.9%. In addition to questions about municipal boundaries and the number of councillors, Richmond County residents were asked to rate the current performance of their municipal council. The rating scale went from 1 to 5, with 1 meaning poor and 5 meaning excellent. The excellent rating was chosen by two of those that filled out a survey, or 2.7% of respondents. The number 4 rating, or very good, was chosen by 20.5% of the survey respondents, or 15 county residents. The middle response, number 3, was chosen by the largest number of survey respondents, 27 people, representing 37% of the survey participants. As well, the number 2 option, meaning fair, was chosen by 17.8% of survey respondents, or 13 people. And the number one option representing poor performance by the Municipal Council was chosen by 21.9% or 16 county residents. This was the second most popular choice after the median option, number three on the scale of one to five. The Stantec survey also asked Richmond County residents how they felt about whether the number of representatives on council has impacted the municipality's performance. For example, one of the questions asked was, does the number of representatives influence council performance? 79.5% of all the county residents that took part in the survey said, yes, it does. That represents 58 completed surveys. 9.6% of the survey respondents said, no, the number of representatives doesn't influence council performance. That accounts for seven completed surveys. However, Eight completed surveys featured the option, don't know, not sure. 11% of county residents chose the third option. Another question asked as part of the Stantec survey, has council changed since representatives were reduced to five in the 2016 municipal election? Of those who took part, 63% of survey respondents, representing 46 county residents, said yes, council has changed but it was not specified as to how or why that change had occurred. 21.9% or 16 respondents said no, council had not changed since the representatives were reduced to five. 
11 people filled out the option don't know, not sure, representing 15.1% of all the survey respondents. The Stantec survey also asked the question, has council gotten better, gotten worse, or stayed the same since reducing to five representatives? Of those who filled out the surveys as of August the 9th, 9.6% or seven county residents feel the council has improved. 35.6% or 26 survey respondents feel there were mixed effects. The largest number of respondents, 27, representing 37%, feel the council has worsened. 8.2% of survey respondents, representing six completed surveys, feel there was no effect on council. And the option chosen by 9.6% of county residents taking part in the survey, which is to say seven completed surveys, was don't know or not sure. The Stantec survey has also asked the question about the preferred number of councillors for county residents. It offered options that have not been included in council at any time, as well as options that have not been included in council since the reduction of councillors back in 2016. Of the survey respondents, 5.8% or four people suggested they wanted a 10-member council. 4.3% or three people want a nine-member council. 11.6% of the respondents or eight people feel they would like an eight-member council. The most popular option chosen by 42% of county residents or 29 survey respondents was seven members of council. Six members of council was the preferred option by two people, representing 2.9% of the survey respondents. The current five members was chosen by 21.7% of the survey respondents, or 15 people. That makes it the second most popular choice for this particular question. A four-member council was preferred by just one respondent, representing 1.4% of all those who took the survey. And a three-member council was chosen by six people who filled in the survey, representing 8.7% of survey respondents. So now that you've had a breakdown of the survey results so far in terms of Richmond County's municipal boundaries and governance, you're probably wondering, how can I take part and how do these numbers impact the people who are running our current municipal council? To get the answers to those questions and much more, I sat down with the warden of Richmond County, Amanda Mumberkett. Here's our conversation right now. We're pleased to welcome back to Talil 24-7, the warden of Richmond County, to help us discuss the new discussions that are going on in terms of governance and boundaries within Richmond as a municipal unit. She is Amanda Mumberkett. Thank you, Amanda, for joining us today. That's my pleasure. So let's begin with the obvious question. This is a process that happens every few years for municipal units all over the province, not just Richmond County, in terms of looking at the municipal districts and municipal boundaries. So can you give us a bit of background on what exactly is happening here and where we are now in terms of the process? Yeah, for sure, Adam. So, and you know, you're you're right. This is something that municipalities all over the province must do. We don't have a choice in it. It's a requirement by the provincial government. You know, I've I've kind of heard some rumblings in the community about, well, why would we be doing this? You know, uh, all over again. Well, it's because we must. <laughs> so, to meet the requirements of the Municipal Government Act, we do a, a boundary and uh, a sort of a review of the boundaries and the number of councillors every eight years. Um, So it's hard to believe that it's been eight years since the last one. It feels like just yesterday, but here we are. Uh, So we're we're getting started. We've got Stantec on uh, on board to do the work. Um, They are uh, an organization that knows the county very well and, in fact, have done previous reviews um, for us. So now what kinds of questions are Stantec asking in the course of this review? And I mean, obviously, you would look at communities of interest, you'd look at population, you'd look at the way that the voters are distributed in district by district. But uh, what sense do you get in terms of how Stantec is approaching this and how people can get involved? Yeah, so there's a few ways to get involved. Um, You know, the kinds of questions they're asking are, um, you know, if you think that there should be a reduction or an increase or a change in the council size, you know, give us, you know, give us your reasoning why. Do you think that the size of the council or boundary changes have improved or made worse municipal performance? Those kinds of things. They're really trying to get at uh, people's opinions on, you know, on 
the, I guess the performance of council, the change over time, because we have changed in size. We went from uh, 10 councillors to, f- to five in the last review. Um, and so those are the kinds of questions they're asking. And there's several ways people can provide their feedback on that. Uh, we already had on August 9th an open house in uh, St. Peter's. Um, we've got a survey on the go right now. You can access that at richmondcounty.ca. And we have upcoming meetings, uh, kind of open house type meetings again happening uh, on October 19th and 20th in both Airshot and St. Peter's as part of the review. So um, there's really, I really encourage people to go to our website at richmondcounty.ca, click on the 2022 boundary review link. Uh, because there's some really great information that gives you good context so that when you are answering the questions on the survey, you you have a really good context uh, from which to do that. Without betraying any personal confidences, what kind of response have you and your fellow councillors been getting, not just at these open houses, but in terms of people reaching out to you either via email, by phone, or just talking to you on the street or doing the same for the other municipal councillors. What are some of the responses and what's been some of the engagement people have had in terms of this conversation about boundaries and the number of councillors? Yeah, well, you know, it's been, it's a summertime activity. So I'll be honest, it's been a little quiet uh, in terms of the conversations, you know, but, um, but I'm really happy to see that we've got, I think, uh, at last count, it was like almost 80 surveys already returned to us. And that's really, really good for, a, you know, especially mm-hmm. for a, a summer uh, period of time. It's, you know, one of the reasons that we're kind of extending this process into the fall is because we recognize people are distracted by the lovely weather, uh, you know, at this time of year. Um, so so I, I would say so far, it's been a little on the quiet side. Uh, early, I guess, early results from the survey is that, um, you know, people are feeling like, you know, maybe between five and seven counselors at the table is the right number. Um, you know, uh, we're, we're getting some feedback, like a little, little um, sort of really specific areas around, you know, like the, a road maybe will be split in half as part and, and, you know, some neighbors on that road are voting in one district, other neighbors are voting in another district. And does that make sense? And we certainly ran into some problems with that at the, um, during the last election, right? Just people not understanding where exactly their polling station was. So we're gonna be looking at tweaking things like that to make it easier for people to understand, you know, where they go to vote, who their, you know, who their counselor will be. And so that there's like, like you said, sort of community of interest uh, areas that, you know, it makes sense that they would all be in the same district for sure. Have you seen that on your own area? Because it strikes me that you're one of two councillors, well, yourself and Councillor Brent Sampson next door in District 5, where we see areas in Richmond County where literally a boundary line goes right through an individual community. And in your case, it's Grand Greve. Uh, that's the dividing line yeah. between yourself and District 5, Councillor Sampson. But by the same token, in Isle Madame, we also have a boundary line going straight through the community of Arishat in terms of District 1 uh, with Councillor Sean Sampson and District 2 with Councillor Michael Digden. Are these kinds of discussions coming up and do you hope that the current review being carried out by Stantec might be able to make these things a little clearer for people who, as you say, are just trying to figure out where to vote on most times. Yeah, it's, you know, it is interesting, Adam. Um, you know, those those things specifically are, are coming up, uh, but there's a balance here, right? Because the other the other contributing factor is that um, you 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 know the the Nova Scotia Utility and Review Board is going to require us to meet certain criteria in our boundaries, and one of those criteria is sort of percentage of population. So we can't have you know we can't have uh, sort of one councillor representing an area that has. 30% more people in it than another councillor, right? We're, so that's why sometimes you get these, what seems like strangeness in the boundaries. It's because we are also trying to make sure that the population stays within 10% uh, of each, you know, within each district. So mm-hmm. you don't want to have one completely skewed by another. And so for the most part, our current districts, you know, they're pretty close to meeting that, um, you know, and, and so I, I think that's something we need to take into account as well. And, and of course, you know, wanting a, a district to have like to be one contiguous area, you know, we wouldn't want to have, you know, pe- you know, somebody from, you know, uh, Forshu be, you know, kind of in the district where St. Peter's is, because that wouldn't make sense, right? So geographically, 
uh, you know, there's a there's a lot to try to balance there as well. Well, I want to ask you quickly, uh, just in terms of this particular review, when does it wrap up? You mentioned open houses are continuing in October. Uh, when will Stantec wrap up its review? I know we're halfway through the current council term mandate, but when would you expect a final report from them in terms of boundaries? Yeah, so we're going to be looking to have a final report from them in November. Uh, by the by probably the middle of November, because we're going to want to approve it at our um, November uh, regular council meeting, which would happen at the end of that month. And the reason for that deadline is because we must submit it before the end of the calendar year to the province to the to, sorry to the Nova Scotia Utility and Review Board. So council will need time to approve the report. And then uh, and then uh, come, you know, be able to provide that before the end of December to the UARB. Um, I anticipate we will have a draft actually in like to, more towards the end of October, but it will be November likely before we get the approvals done. We want to leave as much time as we can for people to have an opportunity to, you know, to provide their feedback. Sure. We're winding down here, Warden Mumbercat, and I wanted to ask you a question as much for my benefit as for the yeah. benefit of our viewers here for Tell Hill. There has been discussion over the years as to whether Richmond County should proceed to an elected mayoral system where a mayor would be elected at large in addition to the councillors in the individual districts, mm -hmm. as opposed to the current system, which sees a warden being chosen from the elected five councillors. I think it's important for people to know that this discussion is not part of what Stantec is doing. Stantec is looking at the number of councillors and the individual boundaries. But yeah. is this discussion happening at any level? And if it isn't, do you expect it to be happening again anytime soon? Yeah, so so it's a great question, Adam. Um, so just very specifically, the, the boundary review has two phases and, and it, it must have these two phases. Again, municipalities don't have a lot of wiggle room here. We have to abide by the rules that the province has laid out in the Municipal Government Act. So phase one of this study is for Stantac to do a, you know, kind of a study on the number of councillors. What's the councillors? What's the desired number of councillors that should be around the council table? Mm -hmm. The second phase is the boundaries and the polling districts. And that's where we get into the, like we talked about, like what, you know, where lines divide communities, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's really a two phase um, study that we have underway right now. The, the mayor, mayor or warden um, conversation, you know, certainly people are welcome to provide that feedback, uh, either through this process, through a, our strategic planning work, through, uh, you know, or just to your local counselor. Um, and, and I welcome welcome that feedback from the public um, on their thoughts on that. Uh, but at the end of the day, it won't be part of, it won't form part of the report that goes to the utility and review board, because it's not what they're looking for. Uh, they're specifically looking for that council size and the boundaries. And so that's what we have to, that's what we have to abide by. Um, but yeah, I mean, certainly we welcome the conversation. I'll tell you, it hasn't really been on the radar of this council. Um, it has come up once or twice in conversation uh, with, you know, members of the public, but really there's been no, there's been no, I guess, uh, like on mass stated desire to make that kind of change. And, you know, frankly, we're going through lots of change right now at the municipality anyway. Um, and so, you know, certainly, certainly we, uh, we want to be focused on, on making sure that our, our house is, is operating well before we, uh, before we jump into those kinds of, you know, massively change, you know, changing or uh, type conversations. So, yeah. One change right. at a time. <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. And it's important to make that distinction for those yeah. participating in the process yeah. as well. Like I said, uh, welcome the feedback, but just, you know, just want folks to have the understanding. It's it's not technically part of this study and won't be what we submit back. All right. Exactly. All right. We've covered a lot of ground here, as I thought we would. And I appreciate you taking some time for me. Did you want to add anything else about all of this just before we wrap up? One of the things that struck me with with the, you know, kind of the analysis that Stantec has done so far is that really at this stage of the game, Richmond County is uh, one of the smallest uh, sized councils. Well, it is the smallest sized council in the province. So five is the lowest number of any municipal council in the province. Uh, we're tied with Digby and, and Barrington having five councillors mm -hmm. around our municipal table. Um, but the the odd part of that is the land area we are like we are kind of more in the 
middle, right? So in terms of how much grounds, you know, some of our counselors have to have to cover, um, and also as well as like population wise. So, um, so it's interesting, some of those statistics, um, and I would re- definitely encourage people to, to check those out. Um, because I do think it, you know, I do think it influences the, the conversation about how many counselors there should be. And as we know, from the last time we did a review, you know, uh, the boundary study, I think had recommended a, a lower number of counselors than 10. But council at the time wanted to stick with the 10 counselors. And that's mm-hmm. the recommendation they forwarded to the Re- utility and review board. And the UARB came back and, and required them to reduce to five. Yeah. And so we want to make sure that whatever we're uh, p- putting forward to the UARB, we know they have the final say. So we we want it to make as much sense uh, and be as grounded in like the realities of Richmond County as possible. And so I would definitely, yeah, again, definitely encourage people to check out the website and see that information. Sometimes history, even recent history can be a real helpful tool in terms of being yes. able to make these decisions and form these opinions. So good to be able to recognize that recent history from the last time this discussion came up as well. Definitely. Right? Because sometimes well, these things are out of our hands, right? So Yes. <laughs> Yes, exactly. Yeah. Uh, Warden Amanda Mubberkett, uh, this has been very enlightening and informative, and I think it'll help our viewers as they take part in the process. We thank you so much for giving us some time on Tell Ill 24 well, 7. Thank you for the opportunity, Adam. I really appreciate it. No problem at all. Amanda Mubberkett is the Warden of Richmond County. We've been speaking to her today via Zoom. Stay tuned for more of Tell Ill 24 7 in just a moment. Very soon on Tell Ill Community Television, you're going to be seeing a lot more French language programming, and it's going to be French language news programming. That's because Tell Ill Community Television has just hired a brand new addition to the Tell Ill News team. She's originally from Isle Madame. She's coming back to the area after spending a couple of years in Pompkett. Her name is Gabrielle Sampson, and I'd like to introduce her to you right now. Here's a conversation that I had with Gabrielle just a few days ago. And we're pleased to welcome to Telil 24-7, the newest member of the Telil News Team, the Telil Community Television family. She is Gabrielle Sampson. Gabrielle, thank you for joining me on the show this week. Thank you for having me, Adam. Well, it's a pleasure to have you, and it's a pleasure to officially welcome you to the news division at Telil, because you have been hired as part of the local journalism initiative through CACTUS, the Canadian Association of Community Television Users and Stations, to provide French language journalism for the people watching Telil and the people able to access us on social media. So can you start by giving us a sense of why this appealed to you? Uh, what made you want to seek this job out in the first place? When I saw the job offer, um, it really excited me to apply because I wanted to offer that kind of service to the people of the region, knowing that it was offered somewhat in the past, but uh, to be offered full-time would be a different different story. Uh, And I thought that I could offer that being someone that's from the region, someone who um, knows how people think and uh, to know what's important to the people down home. Uh, would really make a difference and I wanted to be the person to uh, inform them of those uh, types of issues. Now you mentioned that you have roots in Isle Madame. Uh, For our viewers that might not be familiar with you, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and where you grew up and just how that's impacted you through your life? So I was someone who moved around a lot um, but mostly around the Isle Madame area. So my parents are originally from the Lance and the Point, and then I moved quite a bit around uh, those little islands. So I'm mostly from the end of Isle Madame. And you're from a good end of Isle Madame, I might add. There's no bad end of Isle Madame, of course, we'll make that clear. But uh, yes, beautiful spot over there and wonderful people. So I want to get a sense now of just what your recent past has been, because we're talking to you from your home in Pompkett. You're going to be making your way back to Isle Madame very soon. But uh, what can you tell me about what you've been up to recently and how that's impacted your life, particularly in terms of working with the French language on a daily basis? So I'm someone who graduated from uh, the French school system. So I graduated from Ecole Beauport in Erichat. And 
quite a while ago now. And uh, then I pursued uh, my post-secondary education at University of Saton with one year at the Pays de Gras campus and then four years in Clare. Uh, afterwards, I worked up north. So I became a teacher, a French teacher in the French school system. And I worked up north in Yelmay for two years. And then I moved back home uh, to work at Ecole Beauport for a year and have worked in Punket for seven years. And then, uh, so that allowed me to visit different minority group regions uh, and learn about the different French communities that existed uh, in those regions while always having that background myself and having that common uh, factor between us. Uh, so it was something that made me appreciate down home even more by seeing different aspects of the French communities. Uh, and then I'm really excited to come back home uh, to promote that once again down home. Now you've talked a little bit about the importance of providing coverage to Isle Madame and to Richmond County and to be able to provide it in French, which is something that Telil has done sporadically over the years, but this is the first full-time French person that they've hired in quite a while. And I'm wondering what approach are you hoping to take to some of the stories and some of the issues that we face here in the Strait area and in Richmond County and in particular to Isle Madame? Uh, obviously you're still putting your strategies together, but what are you hoping to do in terms of how you approach the various newsmakers and the various community members here? So um, when it comes to global news, um, I think it's important for people to be able to hear it in a language that's comfortable for them. Uh, so um, most people down home are used to hearing it in English because uh, that's what's been offered to them in the past. And I want to bring the aspect of they can hear those types of issues in French and still understand uh, to try to debunk the insecurity that might uh, exist uh, with not thinking that uh, we're competent enough because we're more than definitely competent enough to understand global news uh, in French. Uh, and to also offer the aspect that there are some topics that are specifically for the French community and uh, that maybe on an English-based broadcast, it would not occur to them to cover those types of uh, news stories because uh, it doesn't cover the general public. So that would give me the opportunity as the French sort of journalist to offer um, more of this, that's those types of topics to that community where it's something that directly impacts them. Now, I want to ask you kind of bouncing off of that, uh, how can people get in touch with you if they have any story ideas they'd like to share with you? Because uh, you'll be starting officially in September after going through orientation. But if somebody thinks, hey, Gabrielle might be somebody that we'd like to have a conversation with about this issue, how can they get in touch with you? I would more than uh, love for people to get in contact with me and to, for them to feel comfortable to talk to me in the language that they feel comfortable in the moment. Um, I will be doing my journalism in French, uh, but uh, even if they want to have the conversations at first in another language, just to get to know each other first and then uh, to move towards the subject in French, uh, people can reach me by email uh, at gabrielsamson at gmail.com or they can reach out to me on Facebook just to get the contact information if uh, the email was too long to jot down. Um, so I'm Gabrielle Sampson on uh, Facebook um, and uh, you can reach me there and I answer pretty quickly. So uh, that, will, that would probably be the best way to reach out. And, or if you see me around, don't uh, hesitate to, to be like, oh, I think I have something that might interest you or I'd like to talk to you about something or I'd like to work with you. Uh, that's what I really want to work on this time around would be uh, to involve community members in our stories, uh, even if people want to learn how to do journalism. And um, I think that's something that I, I would most definitely want to help uh, people feel comfortable with. So it's not just me telling stories uh, from the region, but other people being able to tell stories as well. And it's not as scary as you think. Editing is everyone's best friend. <laughs> And of course, if anybody has any ideas during the month of August and uh, they want to contact us directly at Talil Community Television, they can do that. Uh, the station phone number 902-226-1928. 
And the best email address to use is telil at telil.tv. So they can get in touch with us that way as well, too. You've talked about giving people a voice and showing them how to be journalists on their own as well, too. And I think it's important to point out, bouncing off of that, that you're not just hired to do maybe 10 minutes here, 10 minutes there every couple of weeks. Uh, the contract uh, that's part of the local journalism initiative, the same one that I sign as an English language journalist, means that we're providing two hours of content every week. So you're going to have lots of opportunity not only to tell the stories of Isle Madame in French language situations, but also to bring people on board. Does that excite you? It does because uh, I feel like it's going to give a better voice to the community where sometimes we feel maybe um, neglected province-wide, especially in the Acadian communities. We feel uh, overlooked a lot of the times because we're not the one that's mostly, um, we're not the one that's marketed uh, in tourism for the most part. Uh, so uh, I think that us having that two-hour block uh, per week is going to give the people of Richmond County the opportunity to see themselves in media and to be able to promote the region and for people to get a better understanding of who we are, where we are, and what we have to offer. I've said for many years, Richmond County is too often the forgotten county in terms of the overall Cape Breton picture, not just in tourism, but in journalism coverage as a whole. So it's good to have you on board. And just before we wrap up, Gabrielle, I wanted to give you the opportunity to reach out to your viewers in French and to introduce yourself to them in French just before we wrap up here and to invite them to come along. So take it away in the language that you will be doing your work come September. I wanted to just introduce yourself to the community. Uh, bonjour tout le monde, uh, je m'appelle Gabrielle Sanson et bientôt, ben, j'ai déjà commencé, mais bientôt, uh, je serai votre journaliste civique pour le comté de Richemont. Si vous avez des idées, des sujets qui vous intéressent et que vous aimeriez que Télé couvre comme un uh, sujet de discussion ou si vous voudriez participer ou même apprendre plus à propos de comment ça fonctionne à Télé, uh, n'inquiétez pas, uh, venez communiquer avec moi ou pouvez me rejoindre sur Facebook en cherchant Gabriel Sanson, mais je suis probablement déjà vos amis <laughs> sur Facebook parce que je suis vraiment amie avec beaucoup de gens uh, là-dessus. Uh, ou vous pouvez me rejoindre uh, par courriel à Gabriel Sanson à commercial gmail.com. There we are. Well done. And it's great to be able to hear you speaking with such clarity and such a good flow. And I want to say, uh, Gabrielle, it's a great pleasure to meet you. And I look forward to working alongside of you, even though we won't be working uh, the exact same content. But it's great to have you on board in the Telil News team. Thank you so much for giving me some time here today and welcome aboard. Thank you so much, Adam. It's been wonderful. Gabrielle Sampson is the newest member of the Telil News team. She will be providing coverage every week in French as part of the local journalism initiative as coordinated by the Canadian Association of Community Television Users and Stations. Stay tuned because later on in the show, I'll be playing Telil 24-7's infamous Fast Five game with the newest member of the Telil News team, Gabrielle Sampson. But right now, I'd like to bring in a veteran member of the Telil staff, station manager and program manager Becky Borino, who recently had the chance to sit down with Cape Breton Council's Member of Parliament, Mike Kellaway. He dropped by the Telil studios in Arishat just a few days ago. Here's Mike Kellaway's conversation with our very own Becky Borino right now. Okay, good day everybody, and look who's here. Hi. My friend and yours, Mike Kellaway. Comment ça va? Très bien, merci et vous. Ah, bien, bien, très bien. That's about all I can do. <laughs> <laughs> Just letting you know. I'm working on it. Okay, so what's, hap what's up, Mike? What's been happening? Well, first of all, it's great to be out and about this summer uh, throughout the riding. Uh, the last two years, it's been uh, challenging, to say the least, for all of us. Uh, with COVID and everything that comes with COVID. So we've been out uh, meeting with constituents, organizations, uh, full stop, uh, uh, mostly six to seven days a week, making a lot of funding announcements that we've worked on, on over the past year and that are coming into fruition now. So 
uh, it's, it's really about reconnecting with folks and seeing folks in person, live and in color. And it's been so great to see uh, people throughout the riding, whether it's Antigonish County or Guysboro or Richmond County and Inverness and, and the CBRM. And it's, um, I think it's a real important time for Canadians. It's an important time for the citizens of uh, the CBRM to uh, reacquaint ourselves with each other. And as you know, Becky, we haven't stopped doing that since 2019. Well, I know you have never stopped doing that. No. <laughs> so, no, I love it. I, I, see, I love it. I see your red shoes everywhere. Yes, all over indeed. Facebook. Your, yeah. Your very colorful red shoes. <laughs> and by the way, on that note, I wanted to mention before we go any further that I note that I noticed that you're running in some sort of race. The run through time at the Fortress of Lewisburg. So it's a 13 kilometer race. Uh, I ran it last time in 2019 and we're doing it again um, in, uh, in August, in late August. And I'm looking forward to it. It's another way to engage community. I'm from here, I live here, I've worked here my entire life. Uh, I know the people here, and I wanna to get to know more people here. So that you do these things uh, to, uh, to, to get to know people, communities, but also too, you do it you know, for your mental health and your, and your physical health. And I'm really looking forward to it. And you, know, you get a chance, whether it's the, uh, the, uh, the run through time, or you have a breakfast at La Picasse, or you're in Antigonesh and you're making an announcement in Guysboro for a community theater. We, we recently made a $2.6 million announcement for Guysboro development along the waterfront. Uh, Richmond County, we've made significant investments in community organizations over the past year. Um, for me, it's about engaging, and you do that through running, walking, and talking. You know, the important thing for me to know about that run, though, Mike, is are you going to be wearing the red shoes? The red shoes will be worn. Uh, the red shorts and the red, red t-shirt, I'll be just a <laughs> burst of flames, and uh, I'm hoping that the flames last 13 kilometers to finish the race. <laughs> well, I have no doubt, knowing you, Mike, that they will. Well, I'm highly competitive, as most of your, I, uh, as you know, and as most of your mm -hmm. viewers know. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I'm looking forward to just finishing the race. It's a, it's one of those races that you have people that are novice to, novices to running, people that have, have been experienced runners for, for many a year. I'm looking forward to it, just to, uh, to, to be a part of that group. Lewisburg is such a, it's a beautiful town. It's much like every town and village in, in Cape Breton, Canso, whether it is in Petit de Gras or Shetty Camp or, uh, or uh, Pumpkett uh, or Glace Bay, Nova Scotia or any other community. Uh, I, I, I'm a community-minded member of parliament. I like to get my hands dirty. I like to be involved in initiatives from the ground up. And this is one of those that I can run at hopefully finish and then uh, at the end of it, Becky, you have fish chowder. So <laughs> the fish chowder is is my gold medal. Well, it's worth running for. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, the thing is, Mike, I have to say that I often wonder how you manage to get to all of these places because you're everywhere. Yeah. Uh, a lot of uh, folks uh, have commented on uh, the level of engagement over the last three years. Um, because I believe that as an elected official, um, my job is not to sit behind a desk. My job is to serve you first and foremost in Ottawa, but also be with you in the community to listen, to learn, and to work with. And my motto has been get into the communities that you serve. And we have done that um, consistently over the last three years. And that's not a fad or a gimmick for me. This is who I am. This is what I'm about. It's what my team is about. And it's about working with people and you know, going to where people are. And you can't do that in an office uh, in Glace Bay. You need to get out of Glace Bay. You need to go to Port Hawkesbury. You need to be a consistent presence in Ayrshad and Guysboro and Antigonish County and in places like Judic and, and the list goes on. And we do everything we can. Our riding is big. It's large, geographically speaking. Uh, and so the onus is on me as your MP to get out there as much as I can. My problem is that I say yes to everything. And then my <laughs> staff has to say, Mike, you have nine <laughs> different initiatives at 10 o'clock in the morning <laughs> at the same day, on the yeah. same day. Yeah. So uh, you do what you can, um, but it's important to me because it's important to you. Yeah. Well, I have to say kudos to your staff, actually. I have an amazing staff. You sure do. So I have Natasha, and yeah. I have John Patrick, and I have uh, Tamika and Megan, and I have uh, Elizabeth, and I have Maya, who's a summer student, and I have Madeline, who's going to be leaving us to go to law school soon. Wow. Um, I have a great group of people who care, who are committed, 
who are loyal to the riding and who want to see uh, things get done. And because if you talk to any MP, me included, if any MP tells you they do it by themselves, they're full of, um, they're full of poop. <laughs> yeah, that's you right. don't. That's right. You do it with a strong team. You do it with a great team. You, you see this in your line of work. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't do it alone. You have to have a team. And we have a great team. And uh, I'm looking forward to uh, this uh, second year uh, in this mandate. We've done an amazing work at getting money into the communities that we serve in all of our counties and in the First Nations communities. Uh, we've made a lot of announcements to the point where people you know, have been saying to me, you're making a lot of announcements not, not announcements, not just in the summer, but throughout the year on funding. You guys must be very busy. We are, but you're very busy because the community groups and the individuals that are putting in applications for funding to make transformational change or to improve their business or community organization, we need you to come to us to work together. And there's a lot of politicians out there, sadly, Becky, that are looking at in North America, and Canada is part of North America, of course, but we have a lot of politicians that are about division, <laughs> about you know, taking a bridge and destroying a bridge, about creating anger, about creating distrust. And I'm a straight shooter. Uh, I believe that that leads to nowhere. We need politicians on all different political benches who are about getting the jobs done, who are about working with the community, to be honest with you. We can't get everything we want um, in year one or two, but in terms of different needs that community members have and constituents have. But we do our best in my office, and I certainly do my best to serve you, and it's been nothing but a pleasure, and it's so, been so humbling. I was in Washington this summer, Becky, and <laughs> um, I signed an agreement um, with other countries on behalf of Canada uh, around oceans and, uh, and the fisheries. And I did that when I was down there, and I was talking to uh, senior officials in the Biden administration on the fishery file. I was there representing Canada as parliamentary secretary, but I was also there promoting Cape Breton, Canso, and the fisheries that reside within. That's amazingly humble, humbling for me, and it's been an honor and a privilege, and I look forward to continue to do more with you. Well, I think they couldn't have picked a better representative to do that. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I enjoy what I do, uh, and I enjoy going out this summer and seeing people and seeing uh, campgrounds full, cottages full, events that are, are, are full you know, to listen to traditional Acadian music or... or Gaelic music or whatever the, the music may be. There is a sense of revival in our, in, in our riding, and it's great to see, and we got to build on it, and we got to approve on it, but I think we're turning the corner, and that's an amazing place to be, and uh, at the credit is to the people of Cape Breton Canso during, during COVID, you were there to look after your neighbor. You were there to follow the rules as recommended by provincial and federal guidelines. You were there to make sacrifices in terms of your own flexibility, whether it be to, in my case, for my, my, my wife to visit her mother, who was in a, it was in a guest home. For, for months, she couldn't see her, her, her mother. A lot of sacrifices were made, but it was because of you that we're here today and, and where we are here today is in a better place than we were a year ago. And uh, that's a special thing and it's a credit to you. Well, you know, I'm sure that you have many future plans as well that you can't talk about yet maybe or that you have in your mind. And I do. I'm sure you do. Uh, I do. We, 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 we don't stop thinking and we don't stop working. Um, and so there are now more announcements to come that I believe will be a very important to the writing. And I don't, I don't stop advocating. I don't stop advocating for youth. I don't stop ad advocating for seniors. I don't stop advocating for rural Canada because I believe in my heart of hearts that big things can happen in small communities. And the reason why, it's because of the people in those small well, communities. Well, we're a very resilient group. 100%. I mean. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, take COVID out of the equation. We're still resilient. We have to partner. We have to collaborate. We have to, you know, uh, certainly be innovative in how we make things work. I mean, in Tel Hill, um, under your leadership and Nick and others, you've taken, um, you know, the next step in terms of evolving a community-based um, media source, mm -hmm. uh, community engagement source, uh, and giving uh, a new spin to it. Uh, and thinking of new ways to bring messages of uh, education and culture and heritage and news 
two people in rural Canada. Mm -hmm. That's innovation. Mm -hmm. That's because people in Tello care. Mm -hmm. Take that and apply that to every other organization and you'll have a recipe for success. Right, and most organizations uh, are very, you know, they're very determined to make them make things work. I think with, with this organization in particular, mm -hmm. I think that change is what is required. You know, if you're going to look towards the future, I want to make sure that this, that this place has uh, the ability to have younger people uh, with new innovative ideas and taking it forward. And because this, this little treasure that we have here should not be wasted. Oh, no, and it no. should be enhanced oh, yes, and yes. it should grow. And yeah. uh, we uh, in Canada and also all around the world, we need more sources of local media. Mm -hmm. uh, I know this is going to be a shocker to you, Becky, and I know it's going to be a shocker to viewers out there. But, you know, if you get your, your news from places like Facebook, sometimes those sites are a little dubious in terms of facts. Not shocking. And they also have, you know, political ideologies behind them, right, left, whatever, take your pick. We need to have a lens to see the community as it is, you know, based on people from that area who can tell those stories, mm -hmm. who can tell those news stories, that can tell those human interest stories. Mm -hmm. That's really, really important, mm -hmm. and it's something that I support as an MP, mm -hmm. and uh, it's something that I will continue to support as an MP. Well, luckily, luckily for us, we have uh, just recently actually acquired a French journalist that will be... For Madame. I think that's fantastic. We have an English journalist, so Adam Cook and uh, Gabrielle Sampson's uh, will be... We'll be doing the news, the well, local news. That's great. So you have Gabrielle, you have Adam. It's uh, perfect. And I think that that shows, again, yep. you're going to where the puck is going to be. Mm -hmm. You're constantly thinking, how do you better your, your, you know, your service to community? And that's really essential. And bringing Gabrielle mm -hmm. on side in terms of being a, a contributor uh, to Tell is mm -hmm. really important. And, um, you know, more and more people should be watching the shows that you do and the mm -hmm. shows you will do mm -hmm. because really Tell Little is about the communities mm -hmm. that it serves. And now with, of course, uh, your ability to stream online, you can reach people around the world. Mm -hmm. um, and um, that's an important platform to honor and it's one to ensure that we keep. Yeah. Well, having Gabrielle and Adam, are, it was, it's, it's a, a program and, uh, yeah, through a group called Cactus, who is um, under the umbrella of Heritage Canada, I believe. Yeah, and without, without those investments, we wouldn't have those voices being heard. Absolutely. I think that's yep. where government um, yep. can play a fundamental role in making key investments mm -hmm. in people mm -hmm. uh, and in organizations. Mm -hmm. And I think over the last three years, we've seen through COVID measures, but now that we are moving out of COVID, the importance uh, that government places on heritage and, and making you know, key strategic investments in infrastructure, but human capital, people, people that can serve organizations and serve them well, and also at the same time learn. Uh, learn from protégés and learn from other people that have been in the industry. Uh, because we can't take culture for granted. We need to ensure that we have people in place that can hone the skills of those that are now in place so we can uh, have a future, I have a future of local media, uh, local uh, int human interest stories, and really tap into the wealth of culture and talent that we have. Mm -hmm. And we also have to be willing to share our skills and the ability. 100%. You know, I find that a lot of times when people are a little too invested in, in, in the group they may have been involved in forever and ever, and they've fought and tried to get things to change and nothing changed, they get a little bit, um, it's like it's like an ownership that, that sure. that's there. So people need to be willing to let go of that control and actually share the skills they have for our next generation. 100%. Yep. I think the, yep. uh, you know, the greatest attribute um, that um, any person that's running an organization who's been involved in an organization for a long period of time is the ability to say, you know, this is not about you. It's about we. And so you need to pass on what you've learned. Um, the good, the bad, and the ugly, mm -hmm. um, because life is tough, and work life can be uh, rewarding, but it also can be challenging. So to be able to pass on, you know, your wisdom and your experiences to the next generation is really how we keep assets here, um, and we need to ensure that we teach uh, and are open to be taught. That's, that's right, because you're never too old to learn something. So I've learned. <laughs> Was there anything else, Mike? No, listen, I always appreciate talking to you, Becky, and to, to Nick and the staff here and the students that I met that are working here this summer. They're great. Our top 
notch. And that's what we need to look forward to. We need to look forward to investing in people and investing in community organizations. And as long as I'm in this position, uh, there's a day goes by that I don't look at how do, we, how do we get more investment? How do we leverage more investment? How do we make good things happen in community? Uh, again, I've lived here. I've worked here. Uh, this is not about me visiting. This is about, this is my home. Mm -hmm. And uh, I want, as you do, mm -hmm. viewers that are watching, mm -hmm. you want to have uh, a writing that is constantly evolving and growing and addressing the problems head on, but doing it together and doing it with sound leadership. So I'm very humbled to be in this position and I look forward to seeing many more of you this summer. Okay, well, thank you very much thank for dropping you, by. Always nice to see you. Okay, always nice to see you as well and, and to Nick and to the students and to all your viewers. Uh, have a great summer and uh, we'll see you in the fall. And as we've mentioned a couple of times now, we have a new member of the Talil family. She is Gabrielle Sampson. And what better way to learn a little bit more about her from a personal level than by subjecting her to the foolish questions that I ask as part of the Talil 24-7 Fast Five game. Here's Gabrielle Sampson as you've never seen her before playing the Fast Five. Here we go. Are you all ready to go, Gabrielle? I hope so. <laughs> okay. Don't worry, it's like a final exam that you can't possibly fail because it's all about you. So here we go. Question number one, coffee, tea, or neither? Neither. I don't drink hot drinks. Oh, my goodness. So <laughs> you're drinking water all the way then, are you? Or juice or anything else that's cold. The colder, the all better. All right. Well done. And just as well for the summertime as well. Question number two. I have seen this movie 10 times. I would watch it another 100 times. What is that movie? The Notebook or The Little Mermaid? The Little Mermaid. My goodness. There we are. So you're all excited about the live action version coming in the spring, are you? Yes, I am. Ocean Girl, true and true. <laughs> oh, right on. That's the stuff. Uh, I appreciate someone who enjoys the beach and enjoys the water. Right on. Okay. Question number three, your happy place. To be honest, my happy place uh, is Samson's Cove. Uh, I like sitting on the rocks and hearing the waves come in. Anytime I can be closest to water, it's the best. Oh, that's marvelous, and I don't blame you. It's nothing like being by the water, especially around Isle the Dam. Question number four. You can be any animal for one day. What is that animal? I would be a monkey. I think it would be hilarious to just irritate people because they don't expect it, and you get bananas, and you can just play around and be funny all day. That's one of the best answers I've ever got for the Fast Five. That's fantastic. And finally, wrapping up our foolish questions, your dream vacation. I would love to go to Antarctica. I love visiting places that are cold. Um, so Antarctica is really high on my list of places that I would like to visit. I want to see the penguins. I want to see all the glaciers. Um, I just think it's really important that we visit as many places as we can on this planet. Uh, so I try to make it my goal to visit new places every time I, I do travel. And you've been up close to the North Pole, so now you want to get to the South Pole. So that's great. <laughs> right on. That's a good attitude to have. All right. Well, see, that wasn't so hard. Thank you so much, Gabrielle. Thank you, Adam. That was great. Gabrielle Sampson is the newest hire for the Talil Community Television News Division, and she is the latest victim of volunteer for Talil 24-7's Fast Five game. And there you have it, folks. That wraps up this week's edition of Talil 24-7. Thank you for tuning in, and a big thank you to my guests this week, Amanda Mumberkett, Mike Kellaway, and Gabrielle Sampson, and special thanks to Becky Borono of Talil Community Television for doing the interview with Mike Kellaway, and a big thank you to our technical advisors, Nick Boudreau and Cody Party, for filming and formatting that interview. If you have any thoughts about what you'd like to see on Tell Ill 24-7 in the future, or just some comments about the show you've just watched, I'd love to hear them, and you can contact me directly using the phone number 902-625-8863, or using the email address adamjrcook, cook with an e, at gmail.com. Don't forget that you can also contact Talil Community Television with your comments and suggestions. The station phone number in Arishat is 902-226-1928, and you can reach Talil using the email address talil at talil.tv. 
And just a reminder, if you have any ideas for Gabrielle Sampson as she begins doing French language news coverage here for Tilil, you can contact Gabrielle using the email address gabriellesampson at gmail.com or you can contact her directly using Facebook. Don't forget that you can follow Talil Community Television on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Our YouTube channel features every single edition of Talil 24-7, including this one, as well as individual interviews and stories from our shows, and content from our sister programs, Roundtable and The Front Porch. For now, I'm Adam Cook. Thank you once again for joining me for Talil 24-7. I look forward to seeing you again next week with a brand new show. Bye for now.